to an evening where we're going to discuss the importance of outdoor play in an ECE setting. Of course, we all understand as ECE educators how important play is. Let's understand it from our esteemed speakers today. How important is outdoor play in an ECE setup? So first, I hand over to Dr. Vasya Charja to just welcome everybody. And Dr. Vasya Charja needs no introduction, but she is the founder and uh, chairperson of ECTF. She is the founder and managing director of IAFPL and Tender Petals Nursery Schools. And uh, she is the director for the DNA Trust too. And she does a lot of work for women and children, and specifically children in the, uh, you know, in the back sectors who need all her help. So great job there, uh, Dr. Vasvi. And ECDF has recently adopted a village, and she can tell you more about it. So over to you, Dr. Vasvi Chan. Thank you so much, Smriti. And I welcome all our esteemed panelists today for this uh, webinar, which is on a very, very interesting topic and a most relevant today in every, for every child how important play is. Uh, we have been doing a lot of work in ECDF, like already Smriti has uh, mentioned. And uh, in the recent uh, uh, adoption of the village, we have uh, started to work for children from the marginalized sections who do not have the best of the early childhood care and education. So we try to you know, support them uh, through our educational kits and everything that we have in order to you know, get them at pace with our mainstream them with all the other children uh, who are of their age. So that is what we have been doing. And Smriti will also introduce uh, the program that we have very recently, which is Storika Pitara, before we uh, start the session, right, Smriti? Oh, oh, yes, sure. So it will be my honor and privilege because I'm very excited about Storika Pitara. And uh, here, what you can see on my screen at the moment, is uh, the creator for the same. It's the first edition of Story Kapitara where we have the biggest nationwide storytelling festival and awards, and it's open for all mm -hmm. storytellers mm -hmm. and early child educators to come in, register, and tell and narrate a beautiful story. And it can be in any format that you want to be or want to do it. And the categories are there's drama story, there's art story, and there's nature-based story. So languages can be English or Hindi, so that is understood by everyone. There are cool prizes, there are workshops, and the certification. And there is much more. So let me also just show you this. So this is, I've already told you, early years educators, professional storytellers can be there. Look at the star categories, drama story, art story, nature-based stories. And these are all that you would be getting, participation certificates, your upgradation of workshops, school prizes are there. There's a link to register. We would be sharing that also. And the payment link is also given. And I would be sharing that in the chat very soon for all of you who want to register. Details, the phone numbers, take a screenshot, take note down, take a click a picture, and it's going to be there for you. And do join in. So that was about Story Capital is coming in December, right? So end of December, we make, uh, you know, we're bidding goodbye to the New Year's with a bang and with a lot of stories. And right now we are here to discuss the importance of uh, outdoor play in EC setup, like I told you. Uh, Dr. Vasi, you would be like, you would you like to say something about it? Uh, yeah, I think you can start with the session, but before that, I would want to say that uh, play is is what uh, you know what plays to a child, what flight is to a bird. So without play, a child is not able to learn. The child is not able to experience. The child do not have experiential learning without play. So so it's very important. And today we have such esteemed panelists with us who would be throwing more light on this. And um, so I hand over to Smriti to start off. Thank All you. right, thank you so much, Dr. Vasvi. So you're all geared up to know who all we have on the panel today. So this, our speakers list starts from, we have Ms. Cinderella Vincent, who is an early years educator. She's a certified soft skills trainer. She's a writer and a storyteller. 
Then we have with us all the way from London, we have Constantina Mostaka. She's a professional development and an EYS coordinator at a nursery school in London. And she has been working as an earliest practitioner for the past 16 years. And she was working in a nursery school in Greece for 11 years. And right now in London, she's been there since the past six years. The next we have is Ms. Swara Patel. And Ms. Swara Patel is a dance enthusiast. And she's so passionate about dancing that she has a curriculum on dancing. She is the founder and director of Agile Kids and Rhythm is Happy Feet. Uh, she's a therapist. Through dance, she can do wonders. And she's a kinesthetic trainer. So we welcome all the three of our esteemed speakers. Welcome on the ECDF forum on this webinar to discuss the importance of outdoor play. Thank yeah. you very much. Right on. And it is such an interesting topic. And like Dr. Vasvi Acharya rightly said, that we without play, children cannot learn. So we all feel that if we, you know, if we keep them in a classroom, we keep them disciplined or we make them sit in a place and we give them enough practice to write and read and teach them and they would be able to learn, which is not true. In fact, it's just the opposite. At the early years, children's brains are developing at the rate where their kinesthetic uh, learning has to develop first. Their brains have to coordinate, their motor skills have to coordinate. And to understand all that in detail, let me first put up something that I'm very curious about. That uh, to all my speakers, that is, uh, I wanted to know that, you know, outdoor play is diminishing now. We hardly see uh, parents very enthusiastically about children going out to play. When I was a young kid, I loved my outings in the park every evening. In fact, it was, uh, it was a bribe. It was like, finish your homework fast and then you can go to the park to play with your, with your friends and all. Currently, we don't see uh, a lot of outdoor play happening. And they're mainly because of gadgets, uh, lots of gadgets and uh, you know technology around the children these days. Of course, recent pandemic has cut down on every kind of physical activity that the children were used to. And then there's helicopter parenting. That is, the parents feel that we have to micromanage our children's lives. And you know, what if they get hurt? What happens if he falls? What if they have a fight with other children? So they want to avoid all those situations where children can learn from by getting overprotective. So how do you take this? And what are, what are your thoughts on this? So I'll first go to uh, Ms. Swara Patel. Uh, you muted, Ms. Patel. We can't hear you. Yeah, as you rightly said, that outdoor play is diminishing and uh, a pandemic has added to it. Uh, especially uh, the children who were born in last two years have not seen a park. Yeah, that's something which is uh, um, really scary uh, for all the educators when they come in the classroom. Yeah, because that brings so much learning, that brings uh, so much of uh, uh, growth development, which is completely missed. Um, the, and it cannot be uh, whatever we try and do, it's so difficult to replicate that in at our house, you know, at our house, with the things we do in online learning, sitting and doing something or not going around cannot be replicated. So uh, it's a challenge that uh, we are going to face and it's going to, in fact, uh, intensify in last two years. And we'll have to do things differently. And that calls for more and more outdoor play when school, when kids come back to school because they have completely missed that milestone of development. And uh, we have to do that in excess when they come in. Very well said. That's absolutely right. That, you know, the pandemic has set everybody back. Uh, like Sora said that uh, children have not seen a park. They've not been outdoors. And the children, those who were supposed to go to uh, enter a nursery in 2020 have not seen a school and they have no idea what a preschool looks like and you know what what is a school what is the building of a school hall and then uh, no outdoor space so uh, let me hear from miss constantina what do you think about this that is outdoor play really diminishing or is it something that we just believe in i 
Um, I think it's somewhere in between because here in England, for example, um, parents are really trying to get their children out as much as they can. And because the restrictions were not as uh, strict, let's say, in terms of, because we had that ability to, let's say, go and exercise for a little bit during the day, um, mostly during the lockdown uh, uh, months. Uh, so parents were trying to take the, the children out for a little bit every day, um, which is really good. And it's because here are supporting so much and the NHS the national system are supporting so much the being outside and um, they they have a guideline that says that for under under fives they should be outside more than three like at least three hours a day which is <laughs> which is a lot if you hear about it but um, if you think about it it can be feasible it can be done so it they stay in the winter times around two hours outside in our, in the nurseries in my nursery let's say that we do so parents can have like another hour outside maybe after nursery or in between somewhere like in the morning and the afternoon like they walk to nursery sometimes which is really good or they scoot or they they use the bicycles so that that helps as well to be outside in that way um and of of course, you can. You it's still here as well that we have the gadgets issue. Like you, children be focused on green and having at the same time. You can see that because we have children coming in the nursery and saying, um, "Can we watch something?" Or they they say that I'm watching this and I'm watching that. So you can tell that they have lots of screen time, which is not. Of course, what we want, <laughs> we want them to play as much as possible. And as you said, it's, we grew up being outside. Like even I was, I was living in the city, but like mostly in the suburbs. And we had this neighborhood outside. We were playing with other children. I had my knees all the time, <laughs> scratches and everything. Um, and I think that's what we want from the children now as well, to experience that, because it has so many benefits playing outside, so many benefits. So, yes, the pandemic has restricted a little bit that, but uh, we try as much to suggest to parents to have outdoor experiences as much as possible on the weekends and during the week. Um, and um, what you said about the helicopter parenting, because we have it here more as uh, nowadays. I can see it more with the, the groups I am. Um, but there are also like, we try and there are some, let's say charities that have organized, for example, in Birmingham, there is a charity that allows under 12 um, year old children to pay on their own, but there is someone like a volunteer supervising from like looking at them from far away to play completely on their own for some time. So not having that person being there and uh, talking to you all the time when you're trying to experience the world. Uh, and it's even with, uh, even with parents, when, when they go to or a, a, place, a playground, let's say, being on, on the side, like being on a, on a bench a little bit further away and just look but not intervene or not being too much on them and the overprotecting thing that you said, just let them experience the outside. And if they fall, it's fine. If they hurt themselves, it's fine. It's it's in the learning process, isn't it? If you if you don't hurt yourself, you're not next everything. So yes, I think yeah. it is really important. Very true. Said. Yes, of course. I agree completely uh, to, with Ms. Constantina, what she said. And I'm so glad that her country and the nation is supporting outdoor play and they're, uh, you know, uh, asking the parents to take the children out and giving that free time, which is a brilliant move, of course. Ms. Cinderella, your viewpoints on this? Uh, hi, uh, hi, everyone. So um, uh, the question that has just been discussed. Uh, I have a slightly different uh, experience from the past few days. So uh, we are trying to open up slowly, steadily, and we are inviting students to come to the campus and play. Uh, 
uh, so children who belong to uh, the pre-primary section, they have been coming. Parents have been extremely supportive about this decision and have been very, very happy because they have now, uh, you know, all the more, they must be even earlier, they have given importance to outdoor play. But uh, now they are considering it to be extremely crucial uh, for this particular age group. And they have been, you know, volunteering to, uh, uh, to give us all kind of support, all help that is required for students to come out and play in the campus. Uh, we also have made a lot of arrangements to ensure safety and uh, uh, parents have agreed to you know keep at distance and not being involved when the children are playing there are the sports sirs and uh, sports teachers who have taken control and along with them we are there to guide and be with the uh, be with the young ones because they have never come out you know so in uh, the when we started they were extremely afraid to leave their parents and uh, be away from them but now that they have been around six seven sessions they have been settling in really well and the difference that we see in their personality after this has begun the kind of uh, you know they have calmed down and uh, they are able to now uh, they, they are now acknowledging that there is that they have classmates earlier it was like you know everybody's in their own homes and uh, we are just a meeting on zoom and saying hi and hello but now they know that they are a part of a, of an entire class which has so many other students and uh, it has been a wonderful experience so i personally have been uh, uh, have been uh, i'm grateful that i have very very supportive parents who have who are liking the idea of us starting the outdoor play one more time for students and taking all the efforts that children get that experience because as uh, uh, Ms. Swara just said that they have not seen a park many of them have never seen how a school looks like so now that we are trying to open up it, it's been good it's been nice on them oh that's just really very so which school and where are you I, I work with Chhatrapuj Narsi okay uh, it's a school in Mumbai and uh, yes, so uh, the it's a it's an authorized Cambridge Center for early years, and it provides the IB diploma for the higher grades. All right, how nice! So beautiful for the school to take that initiative of calling yeah. the preschooler at least and just to play. So that's yeah. what the discussion is all about. We just to play, and you can't say that okay. And for just to play, so what is the what is the point? You know, you should go to call them for classes. But I'm so happy that you have supportive parents. Or you know you're calling them and the children are getting some social interaction like she just said that they're getting to know that there are other children who are their classmates and they can interact with them on a physical basis which is simply great all right so now that takes me to my um second question and that is uh to do with Miss Constantina, like she said so what about a school which does not have sufficient open space to for children so now what do what do those children or those schools do so they want to you know uh, implement outdoor play and they want children to play but still if they have space and uh, they do not have uh, that kind of uh, you know environment then how can they what are the other alternatives how can they implement outdoor play yes it's a very interesting question because um, I feel lucky that in the nursery I work, uh, we have this massive garden that the children really, really like being in. And it's not very usual and very common in, in London because it's a, it's a big city and like everything is so like the spaces are not that big. Yeah, so I would also but, like to share because they try, that I think Sora is also there. So we are in Mumbai in uh, India and here also we have for space. Because again, it's a big city, it is vertical, it has high rises, exactly. so it doesn't have mm -hmm. uh, open spaces as much as, you know, we would want children to have. So continue, yes, we yes. can relate to it. <laughs> I, I consider myself lucky, but uh, I know other nurseries don't have this, uh, this space, they have like... Um, a tiny little yard or they, they even have nothing or have like a parking space, but I think you can always try to find space in the area that you have and it, it depends on how you make it, how you form this space and turn it into something beneficial for the children. Um, for example, if you have only a concrete space and there is no grass, there is no 
um, nothing like and like you it's surrounded by walls you can make use of the walls around by um if you have fence or walls let's say you can put hooks and you can hang resources on or you can um you can have like chalkboards on the walls uh, you can even use like um, weaving panels for weaving which is very good for their um their skills as well later on for writing isn't it um, you can have mirrors so that they can see themselves and they can see their friends and have interactions through the mirrors or make it even because mirrors make the space bigger, don't they? So if you if you use them, you can make it look bigger. Um, or you can have like it's all attached to the wall, but it's also a good experience for the children and they can use it for play. Or um, even for role play, you can have, let's say, backdrops. Um, you can put like a boat or um, a pirates, or you can put like space and make the planets so that they can use it as a, a starting point for the role play and then develop, develop, develop. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, the children can do amazing things with the role play in their minds. Um, you can, it's really nice also to have natural resources, lots of natural resources. If you don't have a space, let's say for um, sand, you can use wires, and, uh, sorry, tires. You can use tires and you can put sand inside and make it like a small, um, small word uh, play as well. If you put some dinosaurs in there, I guess, or uh, interesting things to dig and look for. Um, you can, uh, so many things, like you can have uh, bag hotels, you can have bird feeders, you can use this little space that you have um, for so many things. You can even put wellies and put soil in and just plant inside and just have this as your planting area, if, even if you, you might not have the space. But if, even if you don't have this little tiny space, you can, um, here in, in the UK, it's very... Uh, popular we have the forest school as we call it so there are specific schools that go and use the forest space the the, the space in the parks and and they take the children there and they have experiences there they play with the mud muddy ponds they 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 make like little fire with of course with their uh, educator there um they look for for things around like sticks and leaves and they make dens they create so many things so it's an it's a lovely opportunity for them so you can or you can combine like if you're not a forest school as such and you are a nursery you can have um like a day of a forest school let's say so we can one day you can arrange and visit the for their forest and visit the park and go there and have that experience so um there are opportunities even like parents can help or the community can help if they have like a space or a, la a land that they're not using and they just have it then if you do the proper risk assessment and you talk with the community you can turn it into something that you can visit with the children of the nursery so there are lots of opportunities it's just i think to try and think how you can make it work for the children so that they can be outside and they can have that that possibility um because it's the outdoors, we know that is so, so beneficial for them um, for like reflecting and having some quiet time. If you're making a den, let's say, and you stay inside either by yourself or you can have friends coming in um, or social skills like you, you have so many interactions with your friends outside. It's more open space and more, more free to explore. Um, you develop your independence. Um, because you're not, you don't have that educator, like inside we're mostly more with them, let's say, and close to them because the space is smaller, whereas outside they just can just run free and explore more than inside. Um, and even for problem solving, like finding out the way to solve things and to make it work. Um, and like the nature like being finding the creatures that they can find when they see a worm they get so excited when they see a snail or a slug under the logs they go oh i found a slug i found a slug and they run around and tell their friends and it's that that contact with nature as well so it's so many like in all areas of development you can see 
something when you are outside coming from it. It's really, really and sometimes the children who are more shy, let's say, or more um, not not so open inside, we can see that outside they they can open up more. They 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 are more socially interacting and all of that. So it's really really important. And um, then you will be thinking, yes, yeah, sometimes outside we have like tables as well, and we can use for mark making or we have big boards and stuff. But even if you don't have that space and you use like a tarmac, I think it's called the the flooring, uh, then it's it's for for using with chalks and doing mark making. And they do those lovely, amazing roads all around. And boy, <laughs> uh, so it's it's there are ways. There are ways to. You just need to be creative, I think, and you can find lots and lots of ways to um, explore the outside and be in contact with nature. Yes, absolutely. Uh, very well said, and uh, we completely agree to this, that if you want it, if there's a will, there's a way, the old saying goes, and if you be a little creative, and the second part, which is the best, is that if we give children a chance to innovate, to create, they can come up with a um, hundred more ideas than what we would have. So if we cannot have everything that is an adult-led, and we have don't have everything that is teacher directed, then if we give children a chance that, okay, fine, I'm giving you the space, how do you want to use it? Even they can come up with the, a million ideas. And role plays, yes, Constantina said it, this is their favorite, they can go on making stories and they can make go on making actions and reactions to it, and superb. And another part that struck me the most was shared resources. Like she said, if a parent or a community or any school has a larger space, they can be shared with the people or the nurseries who do not have that kind of space. So at least once a week, the those nurseries can take the children out and do that particular area for playing. And it's for children to play. So everybody should be cooperating and there should be a, a sharing of these kind of resources. And I think if, if we make the parents know about the value of the outdoor play, you know, we make it clear to them and we inform them about it because some of them, Deep inside, they know it because they might have experienced it themselves. But when it comes to their children and their hectic lives and all the things that they are doing, they, they don't have the time to just stop and think, oh, how is it helpful for my child to be outside? So if we do that and we give them the opportunity to get informed, then I think they will be much more willing to cooperate and work with us in partnership so that we can make it happen and we can give as much outdoor time to the children as possible. Sorry. Absolutely right. If the parents are well informed and if we are actually educating them also side by side on the benefits and taking them in as a partner. So it would do wonders because with both the school, the nurseries and the parents together need to be getting into it. For sure. Thank you so much, Constantina, for sharing your views. It was delightful to hear you and a lot of creative ideas. I'm very sure all our attendees must be getting some wonderful ideas already brewing in their heads that are, what else can we do? So great thing. Moving on to my next question is um, that we have spoken about that how important is uh, you know, outdoor play for children and uh, in specially, specifically in the early years. But I think Sora here can actually highlight on the importance much more. So if I ask her, why is it essential to have outdoor play in early years? So if you can just uh, you know enlighten us on the benefits and the importance in a way where we can actually, all the parents and the educators looking at this webinar can gain from it that, yes, we all know it's important, just like Constantina said, that sometimes you know it, we know it's important, but we still don't give it importance. So we would like to hear from an expert of why is outdoor play so essential? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Smriti. So what is about play uh, which makes it uh, so useful and uh, so uh, growth oriented or learning oriented? So even today, when we need to learn something, we have to be ready to learn, excited to learn. Um, uh, absorbed in the learning. We want to learn and I want to know more and more. I want to know, not that somebody wants to tell me. 
yeah it's 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 true for us too right so play is something uh, which um, instantly uh, evokes a right uh, emotion that is willingness to do something willingness to be actively involved in an activity yeah so that that willingness leads to learning yeah and um, you know when you take children and make them you know we say okay it's a play time you see that scream yay the whole classroom children they stand and they shout and they have so so that is what makes learning happens the willingness to learn is very high right because it's fun right now um if you a lot of time even though parents know that willingness to learn is the first thing uh, which we need to create the environment to create then teach something but still they will sit with the book and pen and pencil and one object and say okay now watch this watch this watch this and do this and they're not checking on the willingness to learn and they go on and on and on and on right so and you're putting so much effort into helping your child learn and if you're not checking the willingness all your efforts which you are putting in for even 15 minutes is only 5% is going in somewhere right so parents um if you really as we say play is important play is important play is important if you want your child to learn and learn and learn and learn check the willingness to learn and you will find it highest in play now uh, why outdoor play right uh, the first uh, factor which i said the emotion is there right that they want to go out and do something uh, oh my god the material uh, to explore uh, the nature provides is uh, is unmatched right a leaf at one tree will have 100 shades of green one tree will have 100 different shapes of leaves size shape right um a, a sand pit or a stone or a mini stone park will have some 100 different shapes size colors texture which how can our classroom provide these variety of material you know we try to match it we try to make it we try to bring the variety but it's unmatchable right and as uh, the riju emily method says that environment um creates the learning or environment has in such a environment has to be such that it uh, leads to learning and uh, nobody can uh, but nature nobody can give this this variety to explore feel shape size color sound yeah so uh, that's why outdoor plays again very important the material gives is unmatched yeah now um uh, the another important thing which outdoor play gives is we will we'll have to ask children to stop playing yeah and not say come on go and do this come on go and do this. come on come on do painting come on do dabbing come on do this go there yeah like, come on let's get out let's go stop it yeah we have to say that so it is self directed yeah and self involved way of learning which uh, which is amazing right so that's why uh, that's the reason play uh, outdoor play is unmatched way of learning uh, because it gives all three which is emotion material and um, involvement yeah now uh, maybe sometimes this can be brought into a classroom like we, we as educators we know how much effort we take right to create the engaging environment to get the material but what is really what something about outdoor play which is very difficult to bring in the classroom is uh, the motor skill development yeah the amount of motor skill development it allows Uh, which is jumping the so the largeness of it you know when i'm trying to say you know i'm not talking about just jumping here little bit hops and jumps it's or running uh, with the uh, full intensity or making big moves reaching their ex- extremities using the loud voices yeah is something that is not possible uh, in a classroom so there are two things about outdoor play one is the interaction with the material and the other is the physical um a development or motor skill development brings the two very important part which it brings in so that is something which is very difficult to be brought in the classroom uh, now a lot of time people say okay so why um, no 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 uh, my i want my child to learn abcd first then they'll jump and then they'll play and then they'll tumble and then they will roll yeah so for a lot of people it's because they don't know really why and how it works let me share a slide 
which was an eye opener for me when I learned about uh, sensor integration system, which was, um, yeah, you see that house? Yeah. So this is how a central nervous system is built uh, or the sensory integration system is how we um, develop one sense after the other and how we take inputs to uh, grow and build our learning. Okay, so if you see the top, let's see the top of the house. Okay, the top of the house is daily active. Obviously, we want our children to do our daily activities independently. We want academic learning and we want uh, them to manage the behavior, right? So the top is the three things we want to achieve. We want to achieve. If you see the bottom base, yeah, is touch, which is tactile, body position, which is proprioception, movement and balance which is a vestibular system. So this is the base of sensory integration system. So when you stimulate a lot here, you build the necks easily. Yeah, it's like a foundation. When you do a lot of work in the other five senses, smell, vision, hearing, you build the other layer easily. You, if you see where is the eye-hand coordination, it's right at top. And you try to do it, write it down. Yeah, so it, if you go the natural way and just, so once you know this, you realize the importance, how much I need to move uh, to be. Now, if you, if you count, if you count the elements here out of 15, so there are 15 here, okay? One, two, movement, if you have 15, one, two, three, four, five, six, 15 of them, um, 11 are related to body. Let's just count movement and balance, body position, touch, I would consider as body, not the smell, vision, hearing, taste, I will not consider body. Awareness of two body side, posture, security, body scheme, motor planning, Gross motor, eye hand coordination. You realize that? Out of these, these many are related to body and movement, right? So when we really use our body and movement to the fullest, everything starts falling in place. It's like a puzzle. And you automatically you start learning better, your attention is better, your behavior is better, you're able to do, do your daily activities by yourself, you're, able, you're independent, it just starts happening. Yeah. So once you're aware of this, you just realize that, oh my God, yeah, there is no other way but to let them play and jump and move and, uh, yeah. So that was something uh, which I really wanted to share today. Um, so that is that is something which cannot be brought as much in the classroom. The second thing is the risk-taking ability, which the outdoor play brings in, you know, getting bruised, getting fall. There is no symmetry. Still, when you go to a classroom, there's a symmetry. Yeah, there is no symmetry. The weather can be different any day. You have to deal with it. So the plan B comes in, you have to deal with it. So the risk taking ability. Um, social, so a lot of time when we try to develop communication auditory skills with children, uh, the, um, yes, asking them to speak about an object or speak about a topic. Now that is something which is not very natural to speak about something, then to have a communication with your friend about an object, about trying to, trying to build something. So that communication is a real communication where you're thinking, you're trying to put words together, you're trying to actually communicate, not just wrote, learn something and say. So the real communication which we say happens a lot during play with the friends, yeah, which is sometimes very difficult to bring in your classroom because of teaching methodology, the way we teach, right? Um, again, vitamin D, impossible. Right, which can be brought into classroom, and you know how important it is for your bones, uh, for your immunity. Blah 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 blah. Yes, and so that's something which you cannot get in the classroom. So I'm just trying to touch points which are difficult to bring in the classroom. Yeah, um, and um, the fifth point is sleep. You know, when you really play out a lot, we sleep better at night, and sleep is the food for. Um, um, as we know, you know, your brain uh, actually builds memory, retention, um, everything, muscles at night. So again, the sleep, it brings in good sleep. And uh, the most important and very relevant for today's day is, you know, when I say, when we look around today, uh, the next generation needs a very high empathy towards environment, especially with what's happening around and what we have done, uh, you know, around with the Mother Earth. The, the next generation is to go with huge empathy. Yeah. So outdoor play blossoms, the love and care for nature. And if our children don't grow with it, all of us are going to be in trouble. 
yeah, all of us are going to be trouble. Um, so, you know, I would like to end by a quote by Maria Montessori, and I loved it. Uh, there must be a provision for a child to have contact with nature, to understand, appreciate the order, harmony, and beauty in nature. I think I'll end by that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Swara. That was wonderful. And the house that you showed was absolutely relevant because uh, if you don't build the foundation, you can't reach to the roof. And the roof is something that we are aiming at. So let's build the foundation first. And of all the 15 terminology that she had on the house, uh, 11 were body. So yeah. let's work on the I, body. More than half. <laughs> more, more, much more than half. Much so more. the busy thing is that let's work on the body. Let's give the children mm. movement. So you yeah. would see that children mm. in early years can hardly sit straight. They have so much of sensations and sensory skills in their fingertips and on their toes. They want to run around. They want to touch everything. They want to taste everything. It's the at the highest. The sensory development is at the highest in the early years. And uh, Swara mentioned Reggio Melia. Yes, of course. Uh, Loris Malagosi said the children have a hundred languages, and of course, an environment has to be the third teacher. Where all this, whereas we miss the environment completely. We feel the first teacher is the mother, the second is the teacher, and uh, it stops there. So we hardly consider that the child. Uh, himself or herself is also very well attuned to and is very capable of learning if only we give them those opportunities and that environment and that nurturing safe environment to play grow develop at their own pace thank you so much Sarah, for sharing your thoughts and that house was wonderful thanks for sharing it on this platform for us uh, and now we move on to Miss Cinderella because their school has already started calling in preschool children to get together to play and enjoy an outdoor space. Uh, so, of course, before the pandemic also, like I said, the parents were paranoid about, uh, you know, letting the children play, they could hover around them because they get very tense about whether, what if the child falls, get hurt. In fact, even if they get a scratch, the the you know as a mother i would be in tears and so is so are the other mothers also they feel so emotional about it here what safety measures according to you miss Cinderella, um, needs to be kept in mind for outdoor play so what do you think can be the strategies that the school can adopt and what will be the curriculum components that has to be designed well planned and implemented uh, safely, securely, and successfully to optimize the physical development of children. Yeah. So, please. Uh, yes. So, uh, as uh, I will be, uh, you know, giving uh, talking more about uh, the safety measures. Uh, so, I shall uh, uh, give away a few uh, safety measures that I felt. Uh, uh, I feel is like extremely important and what we always follow. Let me present a slide to you. And uh, this question is definitely a very, very important uh, question as to what are the safety measures we keep in mind when we are talking about uh, outdoor play. So we have few people on the, on the panel and they may also think uh, and tell us, like they may share their uh, experiences of what is it that they keep in mind when they are, uh, you know, conducting outdoor play with uh, their learners. So please go ahead, take a take a minute or so, think about it, and you may you may you know share your uh, thoughts about um, things that you keep in mind when when you are uh, having a session which is outdoors, wherein you are encouraging children to play outdoors. What is it that you keep in mind? Yeah. So we'll take it from there. So all the viewers who are on Facebook. If you're an early childhood educator or a parent, please do write in the comments box of what safety measures do you take? And also what safety measures do you want the school to take? So both ways you can put up in the comments box and here we can, of course, have, uh, we can start with Constantina. Uh, what kind of safety measures do you keep in mind if you can share for us in your nursery? Yes, most of the times we do, um... We are assessing the, the actual space outside the garden um, and we, we, are, we are making sure that all the gates and everything that we have around is closed. Um, we make sure that there are no 
like pointy um, sticks or anything sticking out for the children, that, or if there are any outdoor uh, sockets and, and things like that, they are covered completely so that the children um, don't have the danger to go there. Um, um, we also assess if there is like, because um, we have lots of animals like foxes coming around at night and wandering around and <laughs> doing the, <laughs> um, doing things. So we need to assess as well, like if there is also that or the birds that eat a lot and then they have to, of course, <laughs> um, leave their mark, let's say, on our garden. So these also, we, we, we usually make sure that um, we wipe all these off so that children don't get um, any diseases or anything from touching right. those things. Mm -hmm. um, okay. These are, let's say, the, the basic things that we, we look for from like a first, the first point, like we go outside and we do that. Of course, we need to assess the, the actual um, play materials that we have, the toys that we have, if the, anything is broken and if anything is dangerous to use, we need to remove. Um, so yes, in general, these are mostly the things that we look at. Right. Thank you so much for sharing and quite different kind of safety measures that each one would have, all of us have lab to take. Uh, Swara, you have something to add or we go over to Mr. Rana? Yes, I have something very interesting here. So the environment requires an assessment. Uh, another thing which as a movement educator, as a dance educator, which we teach our children uh, is controlling their energy. Uh, while they're in outdoor play. So, uh, because a lot of times, especially in schools, uh, the space is small uh, and there are 20 children in a small classroom. And if they run around, there is going to be uh, some injury or something you don't want you, right? Some, something which uh, uh, may lead to injuries. So this is something which we start our class with is playing a game where they understand the difference between no movement versus safe movement. How to move safely, taking care of your friends. You can be running, but still you have to be aware. Okay. So we play a game where you know you put spots on the, on the uh, floor um, and we say, okay, this is my dancing spot. And we get them excited about the spot and we say, okay, so you uh, play the music and you hop like a bunny and you go around, but no pushing, no pulling, no touching. That's a challenge we place. And we make them move around. And when the music stops, you take slow and big steps and come back. So we model this with you teachers. Uh, and what we see is that even a small, because it's another safety lapse, right? Which you forget a lot of times, especially in small classroom with 30 children, right? Uh, and even in a small classroom with 30 children, uh, just in after two classes, they could be running a skelter everywhere and you will not see them banging, even, even nursery kids. So we, I educate them, uh, uh, we educate them from no movement to safe movement. Because otherwise it's like, no moving, no moving, sit down, no moving. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, uh that's an awesome thing no movement to safe movement I yeah, would, uh, of yes. course I, I am going to advocate this now because most of the time the teachers and educators and as parents we keep telling them don't run exactly. sit down don't move so from no movement and all these don'ts we can have a positive reinforcement of safe movement yes. so there i have been in schools where they say that okay not to say not don't run let's say let's walk properly or let's talk softly or let's run with a little you know with mindfulness so these are the kind of things that those positive statements can definitely help because they register faster in children uh, and for on record, no's and don'ts uh, don't register uh, in children's minds. And if they're all women here, so I can say in husband's minds also, they don't understand. <laughs> Over to you, Ms. Cinderella. <laughs> Thank you. So I really like both teachers uh, sharing their view viewpoints uh, on this particular question. So firstly, Ms. Uh, Constantina uh, told uh, us that, you know, uh, some pointy objects, she, they really check on to that. They see to it that the equipments are in good condition. They are mean, whether, you know, anything is bro uh, broken because that can cause serious injuries among children. Uh, we had Ms. Swara uh, trying to tell us that if the class is small, but there are more, uh, the number of students is higher, then how they can, uh, they can be modeled or they can be trained on to using 
using the space in a way that the, the enjoyment is not affected. They are still having fun. They are still enjoying, but taking care of their own well-being and the well-being of uh, uh, their fellow classmates. So um, a very good points uh, shared here. And I would like to add on to it. When we are conducting the outdoor play, when we are initiating outdoor play, we always see to it that there's an adult supervision happening. So there is an adult present, uh, keeping in mind the ratio of students we have, like if we have around 20 students, then we'll have two teachers around or three teachers around. But uh, though we are not interfering in their game or interfering in their play time, but definitely we are very much around them. We are, we are placed uh, in corners or we are observing, even if we are far, but we are take, we are observing them and uh, uh, so that you know anytime they need any help from us we we are uh, we can reach them quickly so uh, adult supervision is definitely uh, an area that we need to keep in mind uh, re, uh, 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 again coming to the point that children need to play with age appropriate equipments uh, so you know um, uh, it could be that your playground is uh, shared by different age groups so there could be uh, equipments uh, um, designed for different age groups but that's uh, at the, if this is the situation you can label them uh, and you know uh, children can be trained into using the uh, the equipments that are actually for them and not trying to move to uh, uh, a very complex uh, kind of uh, exercise which is not meant for them to avoid any kind of further uh, injuries or any any um, uh, any accidents there, uh, we, uh, this is sometimes ignored and which is very very important that you need to provide proper fall surfaces. So every year a lot of uh, a high number of cases get registered which are which are of young children falling on surfaces that is actually very hard. So, uh, you know, if, 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 if uh, yeah, the construction is of, uh, made out of concrete and the child falls on, uh, on that surface, the injury or the, the, uh, the wound will be uh, very deep and it will be very painful compared to uh, uh, having uh, softer surfaces or uh, surfaces that are meant for play areas. So while designing play areas, also educators and uh, the management need to uh, consider this. It's very, very important to um, having, if there's, there's a swing, then if a child accidentally falls, then where is the child going to land? Is it is the child going to land on a very hard surface? This needs to be this needs to be uh, given a thought before that area is designed. But if you notice, like when we were younger, we would have uh, uh, you know a very uh, like sand kind of thing, you know. So even if you fall, you are landing on the sand, and you the 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 you're not really uh, hurt. Or there's no cut or bruises. It's just that oh, I fell down, so I'm going to get up again and go back to play. So we didn't realize that the why the sand is there, but the reason is that that's the the fall surfaces are very important. We need to consider it when we are designing our outdoor play area. Uh, next, I would say is maintaining superior quality of equipments. Uh, uh, you know, uh, saying it again, what the point that Miss uh, Constantina uh, shared with us, it's extremely important that there is a quality check done at inter uh, at regular intervals because equipments can uh, break any time. Uh, they can get rusted over time. Uh, they they will need repair. Uh, you know, they but but somebody has to keep auditing those equipments, and if they are absolutely can't be used and they shouldn't be kept in the in the play area they should be removed so these are few points that we can keep in mind when we are designing our outdoor area or uh, initiating an outdoor play with our students uh, coming to the uh, next part of my uh, uh, my discussion with you like how can our curriculum support physical development so it's a very interesting uh, um, interesting question like how can uh, we as teachers uh, promote physical development and how can we bring it not only uh, in outdoors but how can we bring it in class and from class it can you know it, it can be a good uh, transition outdoors so what do you think like is there any any ideas that you get like how can you um, you know encourage physical development uh, in your curriculum any strategies or any components you would like to think about or you so, have any idea yeah miss cinderella so the thing is that uh, we'll not have swara started on this uh, discussion we'll need a, another webinar for this <laughs> because <laughs> she has a curriculum on outdoor space and dances <laughs> and how to bring kinesthetic learning in the classroom so she'll need full one hour 
Uh, oh. <laughs> and here, so we will request you to go ahead with it. What I can, okay. of course, share with you is that in case we can bring that curriculum in a fun manner, like even our learning of the letters of the alphabet and numbers and everything through can be through games, through the mm. picture that is uh, showing on the screen right now, like hopscotch and all that we were also used mm. to. When we give turns to children to actually interact and play in a manner where they're learning also and uh, uh, simultaneously physical development is happening, then nothing, yes. nothing can be better, right? Yes. O over yes. to you, Miss Cinderella. Thank you very much for guiding. Sorry, Swara. <laughs> so, uh, good points shared here by Ms. Smriti. Let me let me uh, share my inputs on the same question. Like, if I have to make changes in my curriculum or I have to enhance it in a way that it is going to support physical development uh, of children, then I would really want to design lessons that are multisensory. Uh, multisensory in a way, uh, multisensory lessons, as we all know, are lessons which will use, uh, which will allow the child to use more than one of his senses. And if I am, uh, if I am, uh, you know, consciously designing lessons that are going to focus on his fine and gross motor skills and allowing him to use multiple senses, then I'm automatically, uh, you know, pushing him uh, uh, furthermore to develop his physical uh, strength in in a lot of ways. So this could be one of the ways that we can enhance physical development among children. Secondly, as Ms. Uh, Smriti said that, you know, we can have a lot of activities and games that can be um, uh, designed uh, to, uh, to encourage movement. So do not only rely on times of your sports session, but you have a lot of other, uh, uh, you have time uh, wherein you are trying to transit from one topic to the other, even if you play a simple uh, game like Simon Says, but still you are trying to, you know, uh, get them active one more time, trying to um, uh, transit from one uh, lesson to the other. Songs and uh, transition rhymes also are very, very interesting. And if you add actions to it, then they become all the more interesting. It calms them down. So this is definitely a good idea. Uh, singing and dancing with creative movements will uh, will definitely build coordination. And as we have Ms. Swara here, I'm sure that she will agree to this, that uh, um, if you if you bring a lot of singing and dancing and you add some creative movements, not very regular ones, but creative movements, it will uh, it will challenge the child, as in how can he balance himself and still do the movement? No, it will it will take it will challenge the child and it is going to going to help in the long run. Uh, encouraging a healthy lifestyle extremely important sometimes ignored also uh, that uh, if uh, teachers are emphasizing uh, uh, are giving good examples are giving uh, are modeling it uh, being a role model wherein you know they speak a lot about their own uh, lifestyle and how they are changing their lifestyle maybe they can say that they are nowadays taking stairs or they are walking to the school or uh, they are keeping some time in a day wherein they uh, relax and meditate or they have been eating Eating healthy, they they go to bed early. If if you know, especially with my set of students, I do uh, uh, come across that they sleep late in the night and then they rise. They are not very fresh the next morning. So sleeping, nutrition, and exercise they go hand in hand. And if a teacher models that on a regular basis, she keeps talking about it, then definitely uh, it will support physical development among our students. And I would uh, end my discussion here and I thank you for your time. And it's been wonderful having you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Cinderella. It was, uh, it was completely our pleasure that you uh, were here and uh, wonderful thoughts shared. Safety measures, of course. Uh, and um, yeah, it was a wonderful. Uh, it was a wonderful interaction because we got to know so much about the importance of outdoor play, how to conduct outdoor play, how to have a curriculum around uh, outdoor play. And also uh, the creative means and modes, like Ms. Constantina shared, uh, what can we do creatively if we lack outdoor space, then also we should not give up on the physical development of children, because at this time, fine and gross motor skills really need to develop for them. And if parents be can be actually be re you realizing this, that if you do not develop the fine and gross motor skills, they will not get the pencil grip that is important to write. You want them to write, you want them to do their mathematics and their other subjects in the primary and the secondary, better get them playing. So basically that's the most important point. If you don't develop your fingers and your small muscles and your large muscles, the children will not be able to concentrate. 
uh, and will not be able to develop learning skills like Sora said that you know first there is a will to learn first there is something that is called that yeah I am enjoying learning so learning can be enjoyed in a lot of manner Apart from the fine and motor, uh, gross motor skills, there are some proprioceptive and the vestibular skills that has to be taken into accounting because we see children having no spatial understanding. And sometimes uh, it's, a, it's a sad thing that, you know, they do not understand whether this much space is good enough for running or not. And, you know, you, they do that and they get injured or there is a lack of balance, a body balance. Is your child able to cross the midline? Are you doing some brain gym with them? All these things are important specifically for reading and writing. So if you want the children to read and write well, all these things need to be taken care of. So thank you so much, all our esteemed panelists that you all came together to discuss this very important topic of play. Uh, and of course, Ma uh, Maria Montessori was quoted and I can quote again that play is the work of childhood. So let them work. If you want them to work, let them work. Right on. So uh, signing off here, uh, is Indrani there? All right. So bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Right. Thank Take you. Bye. -bye. I, had a, I had a question, uh, informal question I want to ask Sindra. Like, can I ask? Yes, yes. Huh, I've stopped the Facebook live now. You can go ahead. Yeah, I really want to ask her. So, it's the first real Sindra I've met in my life. <laughs> I was, oh. the first thing I was also very, very this thing about, you know, was her name. I yeah. said it is, and, it is, yeah. and you can imagine if this is uh, if adults get so curious yeah. what happens. So I really children, want to ask you. They actually to... tell me, really? They ask me, really? So really? You know, when you say, okay, you have to introduce yourself and you say, what's your name? And you say, Cinderella. Really? Come on, don't joke. What is it? Really? <laughs> or did you yes. did you change your name after you they became an old they tell their relatives. Uh, I thought maybe you change your name after you became an earlier no, educator. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> That's such an apt name for an earlier educator, no? It's so fascinating. Yes, I mean, you get a lot of fan following just because you're Cinderella. <laughs> uh, so you should, uh, you, all the children would want, I want to be in Cinderella teacher's class, you know? I want yes. to be in Cinderella to be my teacher. <laughs> or I could not like this, this never conversation. Forget my name. Yeah. They will never forget my name. They will yeah, never forget your name. Yeah, of course. Yes. True, true, true. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Constantina, great. And I was oh, just off the records. So about animals and birds, you have to take safety measures for in your nursery because outside you get a lot of these things. So we, Fox. We, huh, Foxes. Fox. I know. We have an area. Yeah. Unfortunately, because we have um, we have some chickens that we keep in the nursery for the children to have this experience with animals. Right. And we used to have two bunnies. Unfortunately, we lost one from my fox. So. Oh. <laughs> we have all of these issues. So it's we near, need to be aware. near a forest or, you know, a kind of, a, you know, you have a lot of open area near the nursery where the fox No, came. it's just, it's just an, an old house that has a, a huge garden at the back, mm -hmm, let's mm -hmm. say. And, and because the owner um, is very lucky to have to own two buildings, she owns mm. two buildings, one next to each other, two houses, let's say old houses. They have two big gardens at the back and oh. they are somehow connected. So we use both of them and it's like a, a big space. It turns out like a big space. So oh, right. it, must, back, it must be like Borivili National Park. Something like that. <laughs> we can relate to it. She would not know, Swara. All right. So, mm -hmm. chao. I'll be ending the meeting. Thank you so much for coming. Bye -bye. It was Thank lovely you. chatting with all of you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.